the mainstream news media. While Americans rely on it daily for the latest reports on world and domestic events, a recent study conducted by the Cronkite School of Journalism indicates that nearly 67% of Americans don't trust major media for accurate reporting. Ask Americans specifically why they distrust the media, and the answers are generally vague. After all, reports of news media abuses aren't normally found on the front page or the nightly news. Nonetheless, they do exist. Dateline NBC, a primetime news program, airs a story in 1992 entitled Waiting to Explode. The story includes footage demonstrating that a line of trucks produced by General Motors readily explode on impact. To see for ourselves what might happen in a side impact crash, Dateline NBC hired the Institute for Safety Analysis to conduct crash demonstrations. Unlike GM tests, the fuel tanks were filled with real gasoline. Look what happened. At impact, a small hole was punctured in the tank. According to our experts, the pressure of the collision and the crushing of the gas tank forced gasoline to spew from the gas cap. The fuel then erupted into flames when ignited by the impacting car's headlight. After the program airs, one of the firemen at the taping of the crash contacts GM. The conversation inspires a full-scale investigation. Three months later, NBC is forced to reveal their role in fabricating the news. NBC's contractor did put incendiary devices under the trucks to ensure that there would be a fire if gasoline were released from the truck's gas tank. We said the crash, quote, forced gasoline to spew from the fuel cap, end quote. GM says since the gas cap was the wrong cap for the GM filler tube and because the gas tank was overfilled, the cap came off when the impact occurred. We agree with GM that we should have told our viewers about these devices. The Dateline reporter, however, said, quote, at impact, a small hole was punctured in the tank, unquote. GM has now x-rayed that tank and found no hole. We acknowledge the placing of the incendiary devices under the truck was a bad idea from start to finish. That's our new policy, and we'll be right back. After the 1995 bombing of the Murrah Federal Building, information came to light that contradicted government claims disseminated through the mainstream media. One source was Carol Howe, a government informant. She revealed that federal agencies had prior knowledge of the terrorist plot and were ignoring several figures linked to the bombing. Roger Charles is a retired Marine colonel and former correspondent at ABC News. His news team interviewed Howe and obtained confirmation of her testimony. So here we had confirmation from a government representative in Denver with the McVeigh Prosecution Task Force saying, your facts are accurate. So we think we've got a slam dunk story. It will be a piece of cake to get it on air now because we have confirmation from a government spokeswoman that our facts are true. The story was ready to air on ABC Evening News, but to Charles' surprise, the story never ran. A few minutes later, a phone rang. Tom Gerald from ABC 2020 was on the phone to Thrasher saying the story had been killed for the evening. Didn't know why, but the decision in New York was not to run the story on it. Peter Jennings' nightly news that night. In order for the story to air, Charles reworked it following suggestions from New York. Well, the next morning, Don Thrasher gets a call from New York, and he gives me one of these. I couldn't believe it. I knew what the signal was. The story was not going to go again. In 1990, an age-old conflict in the Balkans erupted into civil war. A multi-sided and complicated overseas struggle was packaged by the mainstream media as a tidy melodrama. The predominantly Christian Serbs were cast as the villains. A key maneuver employed to demonize them involved a photo shoot. 
The news has always been used to stampede our reason with a, a perception and emotion. When you're talking about war, you get those heart-tugging appeals to pity in particular. And we've seen that again using images. Benjamin Works, president of the Strategic Issues Research Institute, is a military affairs analyst for Fox News and CNN. He recalls the emergency shelters set up by the Serbs to accommodate Bosnian refugees. I remember very vividly seeing tours by the camp commander showing the mess hall, showing food that, you know, I wouldn't pay money for, but I'd eat, gladly eat if it were free. And yet this was turned into a sensational story about a concentration camps. And the propaganda twist on that came out of both the electronic media and the newspapers and very glaring covers on Time magazine and such. Judgment, an independent expose, reveals how a British film crew photographed a Bosnian emergency shelter to look like a Nazi concentration camp. The film crew positioned themselves inside a barbed wire enclosure to shoot out at refugees who were free to come and go as they pleased. The cameras zeroed in on a refugee whose emaciated appearance was the result of a birth defect. We found that all of these uh, allegations of a concentration camp were, were really frauds perpetrated by the reporters. And in fact, at least one, Roy Gutman, won a Pulitzer Prize for this kind of fabrication. And the image that helped motivate American involvement in an overseas entanglement was a total fake. Star system has definitely crept into the media to the point where, although there used to be journalistic standards and something of a Chinese wall between the media pros and uh, the newsmakers, that's been blurred, particularly by the administration, which has deliberately cultivated media personalities who are now present as guests at White House state dinners. And they don't seem to see any, uh, any compromise of ethics or any uh, conflict of interest in that. The executives, the editors in print media, uh, the uh, senior producers, executive producers in the visual media, uh, these are the people that have the ideological bias. And what's probably almost as important, the personal friendships. They go to the same country clubs, they go to the same dinners, they socialize with a lot of the people that they cover. And yet this is where corruption sets into any system. When the censors and the, and the monitors become friendly with the people they monitor, that's when, that's when standards fly out the window. Today, standards in mainstream news reporting have more to do with career enhancement than reporting the truth. Of course, to get ahead in a bureaucracy by giving the boss what he wants, that's how you get ahead. So again, that is indicative of why there's so much homogenization in the media. You know, if, if you wanted to look at a pyramid, in the first couple layers, the really eager, hard-working young journalists are out there trying to get the stories, trying to make a name so they can move up that pyramid. Well, the further they move up the pyramid, uh, the more they realize that, uh, you know, the outlets really aren't interested in major news that rocks the boat. The boat Charles refers to belongs to those at the top of the pyramid, where the interests of the media outlets are quietly defined.
The year is 1917, and Representative Oscar Calloway enters a disturbing statement into the U.S. congressional record. The statement reveals why J.P. Morgan Interests hired 12 high-ranking news managers. The 12 were asked to determine the most influential newspapers in America. They were to figure out how many news organizations it would take to control generally the policy of the daily press of the United States. The 12 found it was only necessary to purchase the control of 25 of the greatest papers. An agreement was reached. The policy of the papers was bought and an editor was placed at each paper to ensure that all published information was in keeping with the new policy. Soon, that policy would be defined by a front group formed by J.P. Morgan and his colleagues. In fact, Morgan's personal attorney was founding president of the organization, the Council on Foreign Relations. Today, the CFR maintains that its goal is to increase America's understanding of the world. However, the actual objective of this highly exclusive club is revealed by the rare admissions of the insiders themselves. In the early 60s, a Georgetown University professor collects information for a book favorable to the network of powerful men who founded the CFR. For two years, Professor Carol Quigley is allowed to examine the confidential papers and secret records of this network. Quigley reveals that these men aim to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. In short, they seek total and quiet control of the entire world. And the CFR is their most visible conduit for carrying out that agenda. CFR members include America's wealthiest tycoons, as well as the highly placed elite in government, academic institutions, tax-exempt foundations, and the establishment media. Ruling Class Journalists, written by Richard Harwood, describes the CFR membership as the ruling establishment in the United States. The Washington Post article boasted that news reporters who are CFR members do not merely analyze and interpret foreign policy for the United States, they help make it. Who are these policymakers? Many of their faces are familiar. NBC's Tom Brokaw, CBS's Dan Rather, ABC's Barbara Walters, Jim Lehrer of PBS, William F. Buckley of National Review, media mogul Rupert Murdoch, owner of the giant multifaceted news corporation. These media heavyweights, and many others like them, are members of the CFR. Powerful corporations are also invited to become members. At the close of the 20th century, CFR influence presided over far-reaching consolidations of media control. In 1995, CFR members Michael Eisner of Disney and ABC's Thomas Murphy merged their media empires. Soon after the merger, the Disney-ABC empire becomes a CFR corporate member. In the year 2000, the world's largest internet service provider, America Online, joins forces with Time Warner, one of the world's largest news organizations. The CEOs favoring the move are CNN's Thomas Johnson and Time Warner's Gerald Levin, both CFR members. Once again, another media giant is created under the shadow of CFR influence. Today, an elite handful of individuals define the agendas that are supported by the empire of establishment news. One of the CFR's strongest media allies is the New York Times. As a major outlet for the establishment viewpoint, the Times has achieved dominant influence over the reporting of national and international news. The Times is relied upon by many editors in the mainstream news media for direction on how to portray world events. In addition, 
The Times Wire Service retails the establishment line to subsidiary outlets such as broadcast news distributors and regional newspapers. Competition between these outlets rests primarily on the style of regurgitating the same message. In the early 1930s, Americans received much of their news about life in the Soviet Union from Walter Duranty, the New York Times man in Moscow. Duranty's articles filled the front pages with gripping stories from Mother Russia. During that period, Joseph Stalin was consolidating power over the captive nations that formed the Soviet Union. One step in that drive called for the forced relocation of millions of Ukrainians. Observing these events on the scene was British journalist Malcolm Muggeridge. He witnessed the loading of thousands of Ukrainians into boxcars. They were being deported to barren regions of the Soviet Union. This program of Stalin's alone accounted for more than one million deaths. This is the most terrible thing I've ever seen. It precisely because of the deliberation with which it was done and the total absence of even any kind of sympathy. Durante's articles in the New York Times sharply contradicted Muggeridge's reports. Durante went out of his way to dismiss them as bunk or sheer absurdity. During the deliberate famine of 1932 to 1933, more than seven million Ukrainians perished when Stalin seized their entire grain crop for export. Still in a March 1933 article, Durante insisted there is no actual starvation or deaths from starvation, but there is widespread mortality from diseases due to malnutrition. That was when his reporting was particularly disgraceful because he denied that there was any famine. And we used to wonder whether, in fact, the authorities hadn't got some kind of hold over him because he so utterly played their game. But it didn't worry the New York Times who featured his reports. Ultimately, the cover-up of Stalin's crimes helped the communist regime gain diplomatic recognition from the United States. William F. Jasper is a senior editor for the New American magazine. The Soviet Union, like every communist country, has what was a, an economic basket case. It could not uh, produce enough to survive. And so every communist uh, social state has been dependent upon aid from uh, the capitalist producing states. So Russia was desperate for uh, our aid, both in terms of direct government aid, but also in terms of opening up the spigots for the private capital markets, particularly New York uh, uh, bankers and, and corporations, to move into Russia in a big way. In 1933, the Roosevelt administration invited a Soviet representative to Washington to negotiate terms of diplomatic recognition. For his news correspondence during the previous year, Durante would receive the Pulitzer Prize. Another Times correspondent, Herbert Matthews, also covered for collectivism. During the so-called Spanish Civil War in the late 1930s, communists throughout Spain brutally massacred more than 6,000 priests, friars, and nuns. Matthews' dispatches, however, depicted the communists as idealistic Democrats seeking to liberate Spain from tyranny. No mention was made of the communist atrocities. Later, when the Times assigned Matthews to report on Cuba, he crafted an image of an obscure revolutionary as a romantic and idealistic hero, supported by thousands of Cubans. Matthew's stories set the stage for a campaign to bring Fidel Castro to power. As other observers noted, Castro got his job through the New York Times. Meanwhile, Matthew's reports assured Americans that Castro definitely was not a communist. 
After seizing power, Castro began eliminating all potential internal opposition. Firing squads operated day and night. Matthew's reaction to Castro's slaughtering was callous. Youth must sow its wild oats. Despite his blatantly pro-communist reporting, the Times kept Matthews on staff for over 45 years. The establishment media's backing of Matthews and Durante points to the existence of a larger policy to legitimize communism. Communism is the most absolute form of government, the highest concentration of government. And so you actually have in the communist system a rule by an oligarchic few, a rule by an elite. That is precisely what the Council on Foreign Relations insiders have been pushing for in this country and throughout the world throughout the past century. Uh, so there is a natural uh, uh, confluence of interest there, not a antagonism between the communists and uh, the uh, internationalists here in our government. They are both after the same thing. The elite, however, occasionally have a difficult time ruling themselves. At a 1991 closed-door meeting of fellow internationalists, billionaire and former CFR chairman David Rockefeller praised his media allies, but his confidence that his words would not leave the room was later broken. We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the right lights of publicity. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march toward a world government. Redirecting the bright lights of publicity is not the media's only contribution towards such a plan. Up next, discover how support for world government is generated as we examine some of the biggest stories in recent decades. The disturbing truth begins behind the big news. With literally millions of events occurring around the world every day, the media simply can't report on all of them. But like the Times slogan, all the news that's fit to print, the mainstream media implies that they can be depended on to report what is significant. What isn't made clear is exactly who or what dictates which events are newsworthy and which are not. This form of media censorship has proved catastrophic to American interests. In the midst of the Vietnam War, North Vietnamese leaders gambled on a bold strategy to achieve a decisive military victory in South Vietnam. Communist strategists believed a general offensive could trigger a civilian uprising and force America to abandon the war. Instead of their traditional hit-and-run guerrilla tactics, they massed their forces for a major confrontation with American and South Vietnamese units. On January 30, 1968, under the cover of a truce for the Vietnamese New Year, or Tet, communist forces launched a well-coordinated nationwide attack on South Vietnamese cities. The Tet Offensive had begun. Although caught by surprise, American forces responded quickly and effectively to the attacks. main force Viet Cong were literally wiped out as a threat in South Vietnam. What was left of the communist forces from the north retreated across the borders. The Tet Offensive turned out to be a communist failure and a huge U.S. military victory. In America, however, media reports of the Tet Offensive communicated a much different message. The battle for Hue has taken an odd turn here. Americans were led to believe that the escalation in fighting proved that America, like the French, 
could not win in Vietnam. To say that we are closer to victory today is to believe, in the face of the evidence, the optimists who have been wrong in the past. To say that we are mired in stalemate seems the only realistic, if unsatisfactory, conclusion. But it is increasingly clear to this report that the only rational way out then will be to negotiate, not as victors, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. This is Walter Cronkite. Good night. Even retired President Lyndon Johnson expressed anger over the misleading reports. Immediately, the voices just came out of the holes in the wall and said, let's get out. And that's what Ho Chi Minh had been trying to do all the time, was to uh, uh, win in Washington what he had won in Paris. To win in this country, um, in the homes of this country, what he could not win from the men out there that represented us. Communist leader and Viet Cong former Minister of Justice, Trung Nhu Tang, later confirmed the U.S. media's critical role in determining the outcome of the war. After the Tet Offensive, what we lost on the military front, we won on the diplomatic and psychological fronts. Above all, on the fourth front, the mass media, the press, television. We have just had, I've been advised, some film in from the defense. Even after three decades, the performance of the American press hasn't changed much. In 1998, America's attention was focused on scandal in the Oval Office. Public concern over this new round of suspected Clinton wrongdoings finally pushed Congress to act. However, news coverage implied that purely mean-spirited partisanship motivated the proceedings. The great story here is this vast right-wing conspiracy that has been conspiring against my husband since the day he announced for president. Suddenly, for the first time since Richard Nixon, a United States president faced the strong possibility of impeachment. Yet only a handful of viewers would learn the actual reasons why. Months before the Lewinsky scandal broke, Congress began investigating a scandal that had become known as China Gate. Evidence suggested that the Clinton administration had compromised U.S. security in order to finance its re-election campaign. The Communist government of China was eager to acquire sensitive U.S. military technology and economic concessions. Through international money laundering, China funneled contributions into U.S. election campaigns and obtained privileged access to top U.S. officials. The Communist money trail led all the way up to the Oval Office. If these facts were widely publicized, Clinton would face impeachment on grounds of bribery, and perhaps even treason. But the media misdirected public attention. Americans were told over and over again in a thousand different ways that the only real complaints against Clinton were that he lied about sex. Yet more than a dozen of Clinton's appointees, business associates, and close friends were convicted of felonies since he assumed office in 1993. Many others implicated in the Chinagate scandal invoked the Fifth Amendment or fled the country altogether. William Norman Grigg is a senior editor for the New American magazine. If Bill Clinton had been forced out of office as a result of the Lewinsky scandal, the damage would have been limited to him. And he was disposable to that extent. But if there had been serious attention paid in Congress and by the public to the implications of the Chinagate bribery and treason scandal, there was a whole host of institutions vital to the power elite that would have been implicated. The media cover-up of Chinagate was not simply to protect Bill Clinton. It was to protect the larger agenda that Bill Clinton had facilitated that was the transfer of enormous 
technology, critical military technology to communist China. During the 1976 campaign for president, the establishment media gave preferential treatment to an unknown governor from a southern state. One of Jimmy Carter's favorite themes was that if he were elected, he would bring new faces and new ideas to Washington. He repeatedly told audiences that he was not beholden to the Washington and New York-based establishment that had been running things for so long. At a Boston rally, Carter said, the people of this country know from bitter experience that we are not going to get these changes merely by shifting around the same group of insiders. The insiders have had their chance, and they have not delivered. After Carter was elected, however, he quickly forgot his promise of new faces and ideas. His administration was packed with individuals from the same crowd of insiders that had been running things for decades. For National Security Advisor, Carter selected Big New Brzezinski, a board member of the CFR. Brzezinski inducted Carter into the establishment shortly before the media helped boost Carter's status to national prominence. President of the John Birch Society, John F. McManus. Uh, the Democrats are out, the Republicans are in, the Republicans are out, the Democrats are in, and the socialistic... Uh, uh, internationalist program, the pro-UN attitude continues. The American people are the losers. They are not being given the proper alternatives. And it's the job of the media to do that kind of thing. We like to think, and people in the media like to think, that they're the ones that dig out the real issues and so forth. They don't. They don't dig out the real issues. They, 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 there are some areas that are off limits. You're not allowed to get into those things such as the famous televised debate with uh, Clinton and his Democratic opponents at the primary season in 1992. Here he was, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission, just like George Bush, but none of the opponents of Clinton for the Democrat nomination would bring it up. Sangas, Kerry, Harkin, Jesse Jackson, Douglas Wilder, they, it was ground that they would not touch, nor would the media touch. And it was a perfectly good issue. From World War II to the present, the establishment has maintained its locked grip on the presidency. The subservient media keeps such information from becoming news. If it bleeds, it leads. This cynical saying, often regarding mainstream news, implies that violent or catastrophic reports are peddled as top stories. Rising water, and the two planes collide. Horrific or dramatic events alone create strong emotional responses. Add to that sweeping statements that stir public fear. The police can't stop it. Reports of war, nuclear threats, natural disasters, scandals, and murders often fill the daily news for reasons other than to inform. Preying upon fears viewers have concerning death and destruction is so frequently practiced by major news that most viewers are desensitized to the actual intent of the reports themselves. Good evening. There are new and dire predictions tonight about the future of our planet. Around the world, glaciers are in full retreat. Some, like the ancient ice cap on Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa, could be gone in a decade or two. It's a dramatic symptom of the warming of the Earth, detailed in a new thousand-page United Nations report, Climate Change 2001. It predicts the new century will bring, and I quote, large-scale and possibly irreversible changes affecting every last person on Earth. Today's population has already set off an environmental spiral, depleting the world's forests and contributing to overfishing and overgrazing. 
Soil is being eroded, which in turn is hurting crop production, leading to starvation. This is punishment, say scientists, for sins of the past, the end result of years of pollution, wildfires year-round in California. That 500-year flood that devastated Grand Forks, North Dakota, occurring every five years. Greenhouse gases that stay in the atmosphere a hundred years after they're released. There's a doomsday scenario detailed in a report sponsored by the United Nations. Sweltering summers, rising sea levels, more droughts, more violent storms. Global warming is real, the new report declares, and humans are helping to cause it. By creating a, a, a crisis or a perception of crisis, you accomplish several things. First of all, people in a, in a crisis do not think rationally. People in a crisis uh, look around and, and say, geez, we have to do something. Uh, something is, is upon us. And so in a, in a panic atmosphere, crisis atmosphere, people are willing to uh, accept more stringent controls. No matter what the current news-hyped crises may be, the proposed solution by mainstream news remains consistent. Global warming is real, and it's something that, that uh, needs to be taken into account uh, very seriously in, in policy decisions. And the emissions are a policy question. If we don't move now, any chances that we have for conserving the environment, maintaining political stability, or offering opportunities to individuals will be totally washed away in the extraordinary load of so many people. China, the world's most populated country, now controls the phenomenon by demanding its couples produce just one child, with harsh penalties for those who fail to comply. Most countries agree family planning should be a top priority the UN begin setting the next decade's priorities on population. Global warming, uh, ozone depletion, overpopulation, uh, deforestation, biodiversity, all of these are being presented as global crises, the equivalent of war, the things that demand uh, uh, immediate uh, action for survival. In fact, we're told global survival is at stake here. And in each of these cases, we're told these are global crises that cannot be handled at the local and national level. They, require, they are global crises that require global solutions. Today, Americans are told global warming will destroy the planet. However, only a few decades ago, they were told that the planet would be destroyed by a more chilling crisis. What scientists are telling us now is that the threat of an ice age is not as remote as they once thought. If we are unprepared for the next advance, the result could be hunger and death on a scale unprecedented in all of history. During the lifetime of our grandchildren, Arctic cold and perpetual snow could turn most of the inhabitable portions of our planet into a polar desert. Just as global crises are trumpeted as reasons to centralize government power, the media also manipulates local events to serve that goal as well. Take, for example, the gun. It's what the media blames for an epidemic of violence in our own backyard. In almost every story having to do with violence, the presence of a gun is the villain. Tragedies such as the shootings at Columbine are exploited to convince the public that the gun itself is to be more feared than those misusing it. The debate is just taught until gun violence happens to you. Investigative Reports airs on the Arts and Entertainment Network. This news program represents one of the many media formats that routinely insinuate that because guns are available, there is violence. Every 20 seconds, a handgun is manufactured in the United States. And every two minutes, another person is shot. Leaving us all to ask, when will the bloodshed end? But the media does not blame gun manufacturers alone for the violence. All those who possess firearms must share in the guilt. Responsible gun owners 
and those using guns recklessly or to commit crimes are lumped together in a single group. Notice how investigative reports edits footage together to insinuate that hunters are linked to urban street violence. There is a war on the streets that is killing our children. Ultimately, the media supports a revolutionary campaign to abolish the right to keep and bear arms. Further complicating the lives of police officers is a new issue, the arming of the general public. Gun violence has increased dramatically in every sector of our society, but most alarmingly, with children. As a culture of violence persists, its backlash has teens caught in a crossfire. With so many guns in the hands of mostly untrained civilians, officers have no idea what they might face when they respond to a call. It's a recipe for disaster. The media's message is clear. Americans will be a lot better off without guns. The expression gun control is dishonest because we're not talking about controlling guns so much as we're talking about controlling the law-abiding segment of our population. The defining characteristic of a criminal, after all, is that he does not obey the laws, and gun control laws are no exception. Anytime you have a measure which has the effect of disarming the law-abiding, you're giving criminals a competitive advantage over the law-abiding segment of our population. And the media doesn't display much if any interest in reporting what happens in those instances where criminals go into an encounter with a citizen with the serene confidence that the citizen has been disarmed. That's a story the media just does not want to tell. The mainstream media continues to portray the arrest of Rodney King as a gang of racist police beating a black victim. It began, as we remember, after white policemen were seen on videotape beating a black man named Rodney King. Well, four white police officers in the beating of black motorist Rodney King. Captured by chance on home video, the arrest quickly became a national sensation. In the months that followed, the establishment media hyped this local event to the point that many Americans considered it to represent police behavior nationwide. This could be any one of 20 major cities or more in the country. It's a time bomb that's ticking under the foundations of America's major cities and under our country itself. To curb police brutality across the nation. The verdict of not guilty for King's arresting officers served as the match that lit the fuse. Instantly, the media implied that the jury was a bunch of redneck racists. We do have a society which is still racist. A mostly white jury in rural Simi Valley cannot have any appreciation of what black people in South Central Los Angeles go through when dealing with the Los Angeles Police Department. There the man was on the ground, covering up toward the end, being beaten in, to insensitivity. And this all-white jury decided that the police were the good guys. Yet the testimony of 58 witnesses and over 200 exhibits presented at the trial revealed to the jury much of what the media kept hidden. King attracted highway patrol attention because he was driving recklessly at speeds of up to 115 miles per hour. His arrest culminated an eight-mile chase in which he cut across numerous lanes of expressway traffic and ran red lights. King was a convicted felon out on parole for armed robbery. There were two other black passengers in King's car, but they cooperated with the officers, were handcuffed, and later released without incident. King was under the influence of drugs and alcohol. King initially ignored police orders to step out of the car. When he did come out, he began acting erratically, dancing around. Then he shook his backside in a lewd gesture at a female police officer. Ignoring officers' demands to get down on the ground, King was tackled by four officers. He rose up and threw off the officers. An officer attempted to subdue King with a stun gun, but even the taser darts fired at King failed to keep this out-of-control 260-pound man down. At this point, the arrest was recorded on home video. Like the jury, 
you are about to witness the first few seconds that the media carefully avoided broadcasting. King is seen rising up and charging one of the arresting officers. The response of the officers is history. Although people may look at the same evidence and disagree with the verdict, the fact remains the media withheld critical information from the American people in order to make the facts fit the story it wanted to tell. The story implies that local law enforcement is a failed institution and that radical changes are needed. There's certainly nothing new about the drive to federalize control of local police. This is something that goes back decades. The major media have succeeded to a shocking extent in creating an impression for the general public that local police are not to be supported, not to be trusted, they are to be feared. And that, on the other hand, we can trust implicitly in the federal law enforcement agencies who will come into our communities and protect us against the local police. Local police exist to protect the rights and the liberties and the property of the law abiding and they are accountable to the communities that they serve. National police on the other hand would exist to protect the interests of the state and the political elite that controls the state. The age-old tactics of revolutionaries is to orchestrate the illusion of popular support for their agendas. Media cooperation is essential to give life to the illusion. We have had so many fooled by the smoke and mirrors they use. The gun lobby is strong, they are organized, and they are scary. Enough of their tactics. They are buying votes with blood money. Marketed as the Million Mom March, a publicity stunt created by gun disarmament advocates takes shape at the nation's capital. Women and their families will push for gun safety in what they call the Million Mom March. Weeks before the march actually took place, the media reports served as invitations for support and participation in the anti-gun agenda. Dan, this mom's march is going to bring enormous pressure on Congress. Now to the emotional issue of gun control in the United States, the nation's capital is preparing for a demonstration against gun violence. Organizing the ostensibly spontaneous march was Donna Dees Thomas's. Americans were told that Dees Thomas's was a mere suburban housewife and political novice who was shocked into action after watching the televised aftermath of a shooting at a daycare center. This portrayal of her background was repeated uniformly throughout the establishment media. Women to watch, a suburban mother whose life has been changed by the gun debate, how she became a political activist, where that's led. That's a surprise to her friends and even to her. Here's NBC's Lisa Myers. Donna Dees Thomas is a suburban mom, too busy with her two daughters and a part-time job to pay much attention to politics describes herself as apathetic. No one ever turns out for rallies about gun control. That's what you were told? That's what I was told. Undaunted, she decided to set up the march herself. What's the biggest thing you've ever organized before? Um, a carpool. In reality, Dees Thomas's is a political veteran, a former congressional staffer and publicist for the CBS News. She is a shrewd, well-connected player for the media elite. Despite the prolonged, heavily financed and national anti-gun effort, the Million Mom March fell far short of its name. However, the low attendance didn't stop the media from promoting the illusion of a nationwide demand for more gun laws. The media are trying to create the illusion that there is this massive outpouring of public support for disarming civilians in this country in the name of public safety, but this is an illusion. It's a carefully cultivated illusion, and it's intended to advance an agenda supported and promoted by the elite that controls the media, and that elite is trying to create a world government. In order to do so, it would be necessary, first of all, to disarm the targeted population that would be subject to that government.
Street demonstrators turned the area of the World Trade Organization conference into a war zone. Over 500 National Guardsmen and state police are called in to help restore order in what became known as the Battle of Seattle. Major media focused on the chaos and the mob's demands. Let them go! Yet they carefully avoided raising the issue as to how the groups on the street were organized and funded, or whether their leaders might have a hidden agenda. Instead, the media portrays such demonstrations as natural outpourings of genuine grassroots concern. We're just normal people who are tired of the exploitation of multinational corporations. Again, for those who orchestrate these events, it's the illusion that counts. The, the familiar media melodrama of the anti-globalization movement that we have seen in Seattle and some of the other protest venues is really a classic example of bracketing an issue with false alternatives because we're told that these are people who oppose the global agenda. After all, they're called anti-globalization activists. Well, what is it that they oppose? They don't oppose global government. They believe that there is too much free market capitalism in the world and that government at a global level has to be more assertive in imposing controls over the free exchange of goods and services. But you see that both of these sides are really calling for empowering the United Nations. The media further stage manages the illusion of conflict by promoting those designated as the official opposition. I'm going to focus on what the other side says and then what you say back. <laughs> the media-appointed spokesperson for the anti-WTO forces is Laurie Wallach. She heads up Global Trade Watch. Ignored by the media is the fact that Wallach's organization receives funding from the Ford Foundation, which is closely tied to the CFR. The friendly relationship between Wallach and the CFR agenda was made clear in Foreign Policy magazine, a major conduit for CFR thinking. This issue signals media leaders that Laurie Wallach should be represented as an expert on trade issues. By ensuring that only false opposition is offered to its revolutionary agenda, the CFR internationalists can't lose. The establishment media employs many deceptions to support the drive for global power. These deceptions go far beyond altering or omitting a few facts. The insiders count on the immensity of their illusions to prevent any sizable segment of the American public from catching on to their real motivation. CEO of the John Birch Society, G. Vance Smith. A basic objective of the insiders, and has been from the beginning, has been to break the will to resist, to convince through their propaganda that there's uh, no hope, uh, that it's inevitable, that moving towards a, a one world government, a one world court system, a one world military, a one world currency, all of that is, is just inevitable. And they present it in a way that uh, again convinces, uh, it tr they try to convince that, the, that it's that the momentum is so great that it cannot be stopped. But more than once, the insider's momentum has been stopped. As Clinton began his second term, he chose veteran CFR member W. Anthony Lake for the highly sensitive post of director of the CIA. But Senate approval would be required first. The establishment news quickly filled its editorial pages with glowing endorsements from fellow CFR members. But many issues in Lake's background should have raised doubts about his suitability for the top intelligence post. Of greatest concern was Lake's long history of associations with groups hostile to American national security. A group of political watchdogs supplied key senators with documentation 
and the New American Magazine helped mobilize public pressure for a thorough investigation. Embarrassed by the challenge to its leadership, the establishment media attempted to smear the organization, leading the demand for the investigation. Lake is a victim of the far right, the New York Times charged. In an error-ridden article in the New American, a John Birch periodical, William F. Jasper dissected Mr. Lake's resume and found a pattern of anti-Americanism. He referred to my article as an error-ridden article, yet he cited not one error in the whole article, and it was clearly a uh, calculated to be a, a major defense and promo piece for Anthony Lake. Despite strong media support for his nomination, Lake withdrew rather than subject himself to serious Senate scrutiny. Victories such as Lake's withdrawal are but part of the solution for reversing the establishment's momentum. To escape ongoing media deceptions, the public must first have a source of regular, reliable information. Many concerned Americans look to the new American. The magazine has a reputation for calling the shots years and sometimes decades ahead of mainstream media. Case in point, author William F. Jasper examines Osama bin Laden three years before the attack on the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. Jasper's report exposes the cover-up that prevents America from winning the war on terrorism. The New American reveals how Washington policymakers had earlier helped build Saddam Hussein's war machine and are using the monster they created as a pretext to build UN power. Newsweek covered some of this ground, although not until 10 years later. To know what's going on isn't going to help a darn bit unless we do something with what we know. And again, an individual, even well informed, it can't stop this thing by themselves. So the purpose of our educational efforts is to get thousands and tens and tens of thousands of individuals informed so that they can link arms and they can collectively have a voice that will resonate even as great as the billions of dollars uh, resonate through the media. Truth will penetrate all of that. Truth. It's the foundation upon which freedom is built. And it's one of the strongest weapons against the revolutionary agenda behind the big news.